Well, hello, Mark with the Church of Christ that meets in Beaverton, Oregon. Good to see you. Uh, we assemble on Sunday at 9 o'clock for Bible study for all ages and 10 o'clock a period of worship, 5.30 Sunday evening, and we have a midweek service, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. Well, I want to talk about fear, and I want to talk about no longer being afraid. Uh, why is God so against fear? I mean, Revelation 21, 21 and verse 8 says, As far as people that end up in the lake of fire, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And our vice president just recently spoke of the reality of hell, a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Uh, why? Boy, I mean, the cowardly, which means along with murder and immorality and things like that, fear, being afraid, is something that can result in you ending up lost forever. Why, why is God so against fear? Well, number one, because fear can come between us and not only God, but other people and doing the right thing and helping out and being involved and... Um, making a difference in this world, and fear can really get in the way. We have a number of examples of that. The one talent man in Matthew chapter 25 who didn't use what the master gave him. He went and buried it in the ground, and when there's the day of reckoning, uh, it's, I was afraid. I was afraid, and he is condemned. In the book of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 29, 25, that is a passage that says, the fear of man brings a snare, or being afraid of what other people think uh, brings a trap. That is, you can, you can actually sell people out because you're afraid of what people think. You, you can refuse to help people that need to be helped. Um, you, you, can watch people, you can watch innocent people end up condemned uh, because of fear. You can just simply say, I'm not going to get involved. And there's been various cases throughout history, especially in modern times, of where Someone's been apartment building, been screaming, someone's been murdering them, etc., and people heard it, and no one reacted, no one wanted to get involved in fear. And you can, you can really start realizing, like, okay, I, I, I can see why God is so against fear, because, I mean, it, it really is a very sorry, selfish, pitiful thing. Book of John chapter 12. In that verse, in verse 42, it says, Many, many even of the rulers believed in Jesus. Many of the Jewish leadership believed in Jesus in the time, but it says they would not confess him. Wouldn't stand up and say, hey, we believe in him. Leave him alone. He's the son of God. He's teaching what is true. They would not back him up and stand up for him uh, because it says for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. It, it's interesting what we can be afraid of. We can be afraid of the smallest things that look like huge things, at the time. Now, being pinned out of the synagogue, you lost social status, uh, you lost financial status, uh, you lost a lot of friends. I mean, life can be pretty rough. You put out of the synagogue, especially in that sort of culture where, you know, a lot of people are not going to do business with you. All right. Galatians chapter 2, verse 12, we have another example that even God's people, even people who are faithful like Peter, can end up just kind of selling out at a moment because we're afraid of what other people think. Sometimes Christians will try to encourage someone and say, uh, you know, what does there really be afraid of? And you might say, there's a lot. <laughs> there's plenty out there to be afraid of. Some of the common fears among Americans are, well, financial security. Uh, in our day and age, going broke in retirement, running out of money in retirement and, and eating dog food or whatever. Uh, identity theft is kind of a fear now that people have. Terrorism. Um, there's diet and health concerns. Uh, some people have a fear of needles and getting shots. And a certain percentage of the American population is afraid of going to the doctor. Um, some are afraid of the increasive vulgarity in our culture, of how our culture is becoming very crude and coarse and a lot of just bad shows bad movies are this, you know, just all sorts of, and, and the swearing, the amount of swearing that's in our culture these days. Some people really are concerned about that and are afraid of what that's going to do. 
Uh, some people are afraid of public speaking or heights or crowds. Snakes, mice, and spiders kind of top the list of like creatures that people are afraid of or being enclosed in a small space. Thunder and lightning. Some people don't like that. Or like me, I don't like flying on an airplane. I'll do it, but I do not like to go flying on an airplane. I say, hello, we're at 37,000 feet in a tin can. Hello, does anyone realize what's going on here? What I find, though, is that a lot of times those are the fears that kind of preoccupy us when the reality is there's actually other things that are far bigger that we really need to be afraid of or have a healthy respect for. How about sin? A lot of people are afraid of spice, uh, spice, mice, spiders, and snakes. But how many of us are really fearful of sin, of doing that which violates God's will? How about ending up lost? How about ending up eternal destruction? How about hearing dreadful words, those dreadful words at the last day that Jesus said he will say to many people, depart from me, I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7, 22 and 23, look it up. He says, many will say to me on that day, and he says, and here's what I'm going to say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. How about ruining a marriage? People don't seem to be really afraid of selfish habits and sinful habits ruining a marriage. How about being a lukewarm believer? More people need to be afraid of that because Jesus said to lukewarm believers in Revelation 3.16, you make me sick. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's not a good situation to be in. In Luke chapter 12, 4 through 5, here's what Jesus said to his generation. He says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more they can do. Now you might say, well, I'm, I'm kind of afraid of people that could kill me. Jesus says, put it in perspective. Even if someone murders you, that's all they can do to you. That's it. There's nothing beyond that. That's all they can touch you. What you need to be aware of is that there's someone who can touch you forever. He says, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Obviously, there... Obviously, hell has to be something other than non-existence. Hell can't be annihilation, okay? It just can't. Uh, because Jesus, if, if hell is annihilation and death is the end of you, then it's the same. Uh, then, then God really doesn't, can't do really th anything else beyond what man does. But clearly, there's a huge difference between physical death and hell. So hell is not like the end of existence. Hell is not just like, you know, you're, you're, you're poof and you're gone. So hell is something really serious. It's far beyond any sort of physical death. Observe Jesus was talking. He's not talking to an audience that would never be in a danger of being killed. I mean, the first century, yes, the Roman Empire, various rulers had brought some peace to the empire. You could travel pretty freely at times, but the empire still was filled with robbers, like the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was filled with insurrectionists and assassins, and it was filled, and, and the Roman government, even though they provided some order and roads, at times, at times could be pretty cruel and um, not a whole lot of respect for the life of a conquered people. And Luke chapter 13, people come to Jesus and they talked to Jesus about the people that Pilate had killed, etc. And, and he says, hey, unless you repent, you'll end up just like that. You're going to perish as well. Not only that, but some 40 years from that speech in Luke chapter 12, uh, close to a million of the inhabitants of Jerusalem would, be, would die. Would die in AD 70 when the Romans stormed the city, took it, destroyed it. Took about a million people captive, but also killed about a million people in the process. But that verse really does remind me that we can be afraid, that we can kind of be focused on the wrong fears, and we can think things that we could say like, you know, that's nothing compared to, and really build them into things that they really, really kind of put them in a place that they should have never occupied in our mind. For example, we might fear public speaking 
far more than far more than fearing not sharing the gospel with the lost. Or we or we might have a far more fear of flying than carelessly surfing the internet. I mean, the real danger isn't flying, e even though I don't like to fly. The real danger is not flying. The real danger is carelessly surfing the internet and losing your soul and ending up addicted in the process and ruining your relationships and things like that. That's, the real, that's, that's something you should really be afraid of. We can spend a lot of time fearing losing friends or our job or our health or, or, or maybe even, I don't know, a, a retirement account or something like that, yet thinking very little about the danger of losing our souls. We might be afraid that our children, well, we're, we're afraid that they won't get into the right schools or we're afraid that they won't get into the right colleges or we're afraid that they don't, won't do well on a test or we're afraid that they don't get into the right sports camp and yet very little concern about what happens to them spiritually or afraid of them, you know, not believing in God and ruining their lives and sin. And so, you know, we can spend, especially in, in our recently here, we can spend a lot of time worrying about things like cancer and Ebola and be very unconcerned about things that are far more contagious and serious like anger, lust, envy, arrogance, corrupt speech, things like that. Things that, things that can kill us spiritually and also really bring a lot of ruin to our life physically. And, and I want to spend a little time as far as kind of help us with the right... I mean, we, you can talk to someone. I know people have talked to me all day about planes are safer than cars and statistics and statistics. And, you know, it really doesn't help because that's not really the point. The point is that I kind of have a preference how I want to die. In a car, I know I'm not going to be crashing into something as fast as I'm crashing into it in a plane. Okay? <laughs> and to me, that makes a difference. Okay, If I'm barreling into something at 65 miles an hour, okay, I'm okay with that. I just I don't like that long nosedive, you know, five-minute nosedive into the ground in a plane crash. I, I would rather just have the short, sweet car wreck <laughs> at 55 or 65 than the long you know, 500 mile an hour plunge into the earth and the ocean where we break up to a million little pieces. I, it's more of a preference. It's more of a preference on, uh, you know, if I'm going to die, then I don't want the long, bad fair ride and then death at the end. Uh, I also tell people that I just, I don't want to get sick before I die. You know, I don't want to get, I don't want to get nauseous <laughs> before I die. I don't want to be uncomfortable before I die. Um, but you know what? If we, so you really can't sometimes talk people out of their fears. Not the easiest thing to do when you throw statistics at them and things like that. And, um, um, but maybe view it from a different perspective. Uh, number one, what we fear might actually be good for us. Losing a job, I know a lot of people fear losing a job, but it's not pleasant to lose a job, but sometimes losing a job means that the end result is you get a far better job. Here you are in a job, yeah, it's a job that it kind of it almost pays the bills or barely pays the bills, but I really don't like going there, but I'm afraid of losing it. Um, why? I mean, it might actually, you might actually end up, I mean, it's one of those things like God says, hey, I can't give you a better job until you get rid of this one. And we might end up doing something that we really like to do the rest of our lives. And I've heard from a lot of people like that, that they lost a job, but they actually ended up really at a lot better place. And so what they actually feared, they should not have feared because what happened really was made their life better. Um, what we fear may actually have very little power over us. Uh, often what we fear never happens. So often we worry about things that never come to fruition. And fears about earthly things are incredibly limited as far as the impact that they can have upon you. What we, as I noted, what we fear actually could be a blessing. Um, Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 that he, he was kind of in a quandary whether they're going to be with the Lord, that was far better, but, but he was needed here on earth and it would be fruitful labor. But not only that, yes, 
he would be here, it'd be fruitful labor, but we also know it would involve persecution and congregational problems and dealing with people and dealing with false teachers and all the things that Paul dealt with while he was alive and the challenges of old age. In, in talking to people who have lost everything, lost everything materially, lost their job, lost their house, etc., just pretty much lost everything, lost a mate, lost kids. I know of a woman, an older woman, who's basically lost every one of her grown children. Uh, they, all, they all died, and she's still alive. Lost a husband, too. And so I've talked to people that have like lost all their physical stuff, all their treasures, everything they've built up over a lifetime, or they went through something really, really hard. They lost their health, etc. And here's, here's what some of those people have told me. Now, not all of them. There are people that bad happens, and they get incredibly bitter. And they say, nothing good has come out of this, and I'm just bitter. But I've, I've talked to a number of people that have lost everything, and here's what they've told me. They've told me that they've never been happier in their life. Even if they have cancer, they said, I've never been happier and more fulfilled in my life. It's brought them closer to other people. The, their friendships are closer now. They, they really cherish every day. You know, they really don't complain. They're seasoned every day. They've never been happier in their lives. It's helped them with their perspective. It's got their priorities in line. Um, I, I've been told by people who have lost everything that it was difficult, but it was incredibly liberating because stuff, our stuff and things can actually be anchors. Sometimes our stuff actually holds us back. I don't know how many times I've talked to people, hey, what you going to Hey, what you going to do this summer? What you going to do Memorial Day or Labor Day? Well, you know, we would go, but we don't know, you know, we got a dog or we got this or we got that or I got to cut the grass or sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes or we got someone coming to put a roof on or et cetera. And houses are nice and things like that, but sometimes your physical things can actually keep you tied down where you really can't go out and do some things that you really like to do. Oh, I would go but, or but, or but. And so sometimes you really have to take a look at that. And that's what they've told. They've also told me that they learned that, what, that all that stuff didn't define them. That's not who they were. They realized, they realized how little they really needed to be happy and found incredible liberation in that of, you know, I don't have much and I'm happy and I don't know if I really want a whole lot. I don't have to take care of it. I don't have to clean it. I don't have to maintain it. I don't have to store it. I don't have to move it. I, I can shut the door, pick up, and go. Um, they've also learned, they've discovered many new friends in the process, and they realize, they really realize how strong they are, is, is that they went through something hard, and you know what? It did not destroy them, and the relationship with God is stronger now. Is sometimes we envy the wrong people. Sometimes the person we envy, life has always been great for them and smooth for them, and they've had this million-dollar smile, and they married somebody with a million-dollar smile, and uh, you know they, they, they live in this house out of Sunset Magazine or Coastal Living or Town and Country and stuff like that. And sometimes we envy the wrong people. Um, sometimes the happiest person is the person that has really gone through something, and they no longer complain about stuff. I remember hearing about a woman who was a widow, and she would hear women complain about their husbands. Ah, I come home and his socks are on the floor and that sort of thing. And she said, I wish, I just wish I could come home and find my husband's socks on the floor. Trials can give you a huge different perspective on life. I, I tell you what, there's a lot of people who have a lot of things, and over Labor Day weekend, they went to a beach, and they weather was beautiful and they still argued and they still complained and they still got in a fight and, with their mate and stuff like that. And, and they were still angry and they still had a bad mood and um, stuff can't make you happy. You know, we need to remember, remember the rest of our life. Um, in the moment of any trial, the easiest thing to do is quit, opt out. Yet, we're forgetting about the rest of our lives. If I quit, it's only going to be easier the next time to quit that much sooner. Quitting sets a pattern, and this is not the last trial I'm going to encounter. Anytime you're tempted to quit a hard situation, understand this. That's not the last hard situation you're ever going to deal with in life. 
And you need to hang in there because eventually you're going to find yourself in a hard situation that you can't quit, like, like dying. You can't quit that one <laughs> in, in the sense of you just can't say I'm up and out of dying. Um, you know, you're there. Also, you're going to replay that quitting episode in your mind many times. Thus, we get the expression, the hero dies once and the coward dies like a thousand times. We need to remember that God is actually, if we're a Christian, God is actually with us. If we believe that Jesus is the Christ and have turned from our sins and confessed our faith in Him and been baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins, Acts 2.38, then the Lord has added us to the church, and if we're faithful, we're going to reign with Him, 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 12. The book of Hebrews says this, uh, We confidently say, The Lord is my helper. Uh, I shall not fear. What can man do to me? You know, everyone has fears. And I think the more you talk to people, you'll find that everyone is afraid of something. And some of their fears are going to sound silly to you, just like the fear of public speaking doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I public speak. doesn't bother me. But probably to a lot of other people, the fear of flying I have, they go like, what's your problem? Flying is great. I sleep all the way on the airplane. I don't like the people that sleep all the way in the airplane. <laughs> because I'm sitting there mentally holding the plane up in the air. You know, The reason we haven't gone down yet, sleeper, is because I'm mentally holding this up in the air. I'm staying awake. But you'll find that everyone has fears. Um, you'll also find that there are things that we need to be afraid of. We don't want to live a reckless, foolish life. You'll also find that the person who did something hard, the hero who was very heroic in battle, uh, the person who stood up for what was right when everyone else was sitting down, uh, the person who speaks out when something needs to be said, they were just as afraid of everyone else. They, they were. They, just had, they had just as much fear. The difference between the hero and the courageous person versus the coward is not, is not whether they have fear or lack it, because we all have fear. It's do you allow fear to get in the way? Do you yield to your fears or do you say, I'm afraid, yeah, but I'm just, I'm, I'm barging through. I'm just, I'm just going through. I'm going through. And may I suggest to you that you just continue to plunge through. You're afraid of something. Hey, I need to do that. I'm afraid of heights. I need to climb up those stairs. I'm afraid of flying. I need to go on a plane. Okay, I just, I just need to do that. Um, be honest, too. I, I find that fear naturally follows people who do a lot of pretending and do a lot of bluffing in life. And I'm not afraid of anything. And when you're honest about who you are, just tell people, yeah, I'm going on a flight. And I don't like flying. I, or... Or, man, yeah, this time of year we got spiders in the house and they creep me out. I just hate spiders. I usually, I usually find that when you talk about your fears to other people, that somehow, somehow that takes the edge off those fears, that you're honest about that, that you're not pretending to be somebody that you're not. Also, I would encourage you to face fear and not go into it because I found that one fear actually follows the other that the more, the more hard things you do, the more hard things you're able to do. The more fears that you just, I'm heading that fear, there's other fears that you're going to be able to head into. But the more that you draw back and say, oh, I'm afraid of talking, I'm afraid of standing out, well, now you're going to find that you're afraid of something else as well. I mean, the more fears that you yield to, and I would say that you're yielding, you're yielding to a fear when you when you're planning your life around the fear, when you're altering your life because of a fear, that's when you're yielding to it. I mean, you can be afraid of flying, but as long as you say, yeah, but okay, I, I can't walk to New England. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to take a Greyhound bus. It's going to take me over the train. I got to fly. Okay, so as long as you're doing it, as long as you're doing it, uh, you get invited to some place. It's a beautiful restaurant, but one, it's one of those rooftop restaurants. You're going to like, uh... Neat people are going to be there. It's going to be great food. I don't like heights. I'm not going. That's when you're allowing fear to alter your life. And the danger of doing that is that you're going to find that new fears pop up. 
you start, you start altering your life to accommodate fears, you're going to find they bring their friends. And now you got some new ones. And, and now it's like, uh, I mean, now your world starts really shrinking. I need to think, what am I missing? What, before I yield to a fear, I need to think, what am I giving up? Because when you yield to a fear, you're always giving up something. You're afraid of heights. You're going to miss out on some beautiful views because there are some views that you're not going to be able to see without getting up somewhere high. You really are. You're going to miss out on some rooftop dining and other things. You are going to miss out. You don't like to fly. You're going to miss out on some great destinations. You know, you can't walk to Hawaii. <laughs> you, know, you can't drive to Hawaii. Greyhound doesn't go to Hawaii. You know, I mean, they're just that, that just that just limits you. All of a sudden, that option is off the table, and it's sad because I, I've never been there, but I've heard it's a wonderful place to go. For example, being afraid of water or being afraid of swimming. I mean, you might miss out on jumping into a great swimming hole on a hot day. Being afraid of heights, as I said, is going to keep you from seeing some great views. Along with that, fear really complicates things. Um, I, I looked at, okay, Portland and North Carolina. Nonstop, nonstop, what, five hours? Because I know it's about five hours to Boston. So I'm assuming East Coast, five, six, five and a half hours on a plane. Greyhound bus, three days. <laughs> okay, three days. Three days, and I don't know how many stops. It's like eight stops or nine stops. It, it's something like that. You got that many stops. Um, my point is that you really need, when you're afraid of something, you really need to look at it and say like, man, what am I missing and what's this costing me? It's costing me time. It's costing me at times money. And I'm really missing out on some stuff. In fact, in fact, it's kind of interesting how fear, isn't it interesting how fear gets us to do some things that are really uncomfortable? Nothing against Greyhound, but I would not want to take a Greyhound bus ride from here to North Carolina or South Carolina. I don't want to do that. That's going to be really uncomfortable, but it's interesting how a fear, if I yield to the fear of flying, I end up doing something really uncomfortable if I want to go there. Uh, stand back and look at your life. Look at your life and, and ask yourself, okay, there's things I'm afraid of, and, and, and so I've opted out, of, opted out of those things. Has that given me something better, or has it brought a lot of inconveniences into my life, trouble into my life, and I've kind of ended up doing a lot of things I really don't like to do. Face that fear, confront that fear. One fear, though, that people have is the fear of becoming a Christian because, hey, I become a Christian and maybe family rejects me, maybe friends reject me. And now, now I become a Christian and I no longer am allowed to sit here on the sideline and backseat drive and just complain about the world's problems. I become a Christian. See, if I'm not a Christian, I can, I can stand over here all day long and complain about the world and complain about how bad things are, okay, but I don't really have to do anything about it. I can just sit there and complain. But I become a Christian, and now I've got to walk the walk. And now I've got to stop contributing to the world's problems. I've got to stop living selfish. I've got to stop swearing at people in traffic or whatever, or I've got to stop... Um, emotionally abusing people or threatening people or intimidating people. I got to stop being a jerk. I become a Christian. I got to stop being a jerk. And I can't just sit on the sidelines anymore and go, oh, my, 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 my. I got to now live the life. And I know that fears, that, that's afraid of people, is that I, 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 ha I have to cash in. I have to give up my backseat driver's license. I become a Christian. I have to give that up. I have to, I have to turn that in. Because I know the solution to the world's problems. It's follow God and it's tell other people about God. And I just can't sit back and say, man, that, that person, boy, that person's a knucklehead. I got to say, and they need help, and I need to go and help them and try to teach them about Jesus. 
Don't let that, don't let that stand between you and having your sins forgiven. Yet, yet you, tell you what, all those things may happen in the sense of you may become a Christian and you get pushed back from family. You become a Christian, you get pushed back from friends or the culture or people at work. Okay? And you get pushed back. You may work in an environment that is just like not the best environment. You become a Christian and all of a sudden, everyone's going to pick on you and really try to make life difficult for you. I, I know there's job situations like that. I know people that work at places, everyone knows they're a Christian, but the place they work at, they have lockers, they have bathrooms, there's porn all over, all over the place. And you know what? People just intentionally have magazines for them to find. And they just got to reject that. And that's done because people know they're a Christian. Okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to just say, well, then I'm, not, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines. I'm going to opt out. I'm just going to be like a whole lot of people, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Or I'm going to say, I don't care. I'm going to follow Christ. Jesus, Jesus, was, Jesus didn't let any fear come between him and dying on the cross for me. And I'm not going to let any fear come between me and living for him. We're just going to come clean and do it honest. Uh, nothing's gonna, I, I'm just going to enter my house justified one day. I'm going to see God face to face and be right with Him when I do. If you want to get together and learn more about the Bible, uh, feel free to give me a call. My name is Mark, 503-644-9017. And our website, beaverinchurchchrist.net. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of different articles and sermons up there and resources. Sunday morning, we need to meet at 9 for Bible study. 10 for a period of worship, 5.30 Sunday night, and 7 o'clock Wednesday night. Now, our Bible studies are, and you don't have to talk, but our Bible studies are like lecture. Our Bible studies are more of like uh, people are commenting in class, and we're looking, at, we're looking at a topic, we're looking at a chapter in the Bible, some verses, and, and there's audience participation, so it's not lecture. Our period of worship, and, and they're classes for all ages, that is, if you have kids, we got classes for all ages of kids here. And so you can sit on the adult class and your kids are in a class for them. The period of worship, the period of worship is very simple. It's what you find in the Bible. It's, we have some prayers. Uh, we have a collection. Now you're not pressured to give. It's a collection for members. They, they, they give as they've been prospered. So no pressure to give, no appeals for money. Uh, the Lord's Supper is served every first day of the week, like it was in the Bible, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and everyone partakes of both elements. We have congregational singing. Uh, you're not listening to a solo. You're not listening to a band. You're actually participating. And so we got psalm books, and I'm not the best singer, so no one minds. No one minds if you're singing off key. We have a song leader, and we sing a number of songs. No one's going to ask you to hug the person next to you. No one's going to say, good morning. Uh, I can't, you can't, we can't move on until you say good morning back. You're not going to be treated like kindergartners. Um, you know, you're not going to be asked to do something uncomfortable or effeminate. Okay, you're not going to be asked to do that. And then we have a period, it's just God's word. And it's not jokes and it's not a travelogue. It's, you got the Bible open. And it's out of the Bible. It's not philosophy. It's not someone's opinion. It's just, hey, we're going to look at Scripture, see what God has said, because that's His will is the only will that matters. Uh, no one's going to be rolling on the floor. There's going to be no spontaneous combustion, that sort of stuff. We've just gathered together for a period of mutual edification, for worship, for learning, and we're just seeking to please God. That's what you can expect at one of our at one of our worship services, uh, no one's going to be trying to hand you a cup of coffee. No one's going to try to take you downstairs or whatever to uh, a potluck or whatever. Uh, I'd love to have lunch with you if you want to go out. I usually always go out after lunch on Sunday. Uh, love to spend time with you. Love to, love to set up a time that we could get together and talk. Maybe you got some questions you have about the Bible. A period of study. Not going to twist your arm, not going to call you back if you don't want another study because there's a whole lot of people out in the world. So if you're interested, give me a call. My name is Mark, or I'd love to see you at one of our worship services. And until next time, we'll see you later.